What's up? Welcome back. Uh, my name is Noah. Find me on Twitter at No More Parties. Do a little bit of work over at BreakoutFinder.com. You can find me over there. Today's video, I wanted to talk about some sleeper rookie running backs. I feel like these guys are pretty, pretty deep sleepers. They're guys who I haven't seen like pretty much any buzz on, like on Twitter. So yeah, kind of wanted to touch on some guys who are flying under the radar, but who I think like have legitimate ability to like be good players in the NFL. If you are seeing a uh, buzz about these guys, you know, go ahead and sound off in the comments so we all know that you're that you're cooler than us. But let's get into it. First guy I want to talk about is Abram Smith from Baylor. Kind of the deal with Abram Smith, he is, I'll just kind of go through his career. So he, his first year, he took a medical red shirt. Um, so he didn't play, play at all as a freshman. Um, the next two seasons, he kind of just sat the bench behind a committee of running backs. Like Jamichael Hasty was there at Baylor. Jalen Hurd uh, was there at Baylor. His fourth season, he actually converted to linebacker where he was like decent. He only played five games, but he had 48 tackles in those five games. So like not a terrible defensive player. I don't know why the position switch worked out okay. The following season, which was 2021 this last year, he converted back to running back and ended up being the starter. In that season, he like kind of went off. He had 1,600 rushing yards, 12 touchdowns, a 25% dominator rating. That's all on a team that like went 12 and 2 in the Big 12 and finished fifth in the A people. So like a legitimate team that he was the starting running back, very productive for. That dominator rating is a 51st percentile number for guys in their fifth year in college. So just above average. But like, like I said, that team was pretty good. 25% dominator rating for a fifth year guy. That's right there with like Khalil Herbert, Joseph Adai, Doug Martin, kind of in that same like 25% dominator rating territory. So we've seen guys who've like spent that much time in college, been this productive, and then gone on to be good players in the NFL. Abram Smith's size is a little bit of a question to me. He was listed at like 5'11", 220, 221, I think actually at Baylor this last year. And then at the Senior Bowl, he measured in at 5'11", 211. So that takes him, you know, that's the difference between like Rashad Penny or like LaDainian Tomlinson and like Tony Pollard or LaShawn McCoy. So he's a very different running back than we initially would have thought if he was 220. So, I mean, you got you got to take that into account. He's also not much of a pass catcher at all. I think he caught only 13 passes in his entire college career. His uh, target share number this last year was 5.7%. It's in the 18th percentile. And he just like wasn't efficient at all. Uh, 3.4 four yards per target, 62% catch rate. Both of those are in the sixth percentile. He took like a total of zero, like literally zero snaps out wide or in the slot. So he's exclusively playing running back and anything he is catching is just like a dump off, but he's being used very little there at all. So that's not really part of his game. And so on top of the fact that he's actually only like 210 pounds versus 220 is like, okay, he's not quite the big like thumper we thought he was. And he's also not a pass catcher. Kind of sounds like I'm not actually that interested in him, but I'll get to it. He was productive and uh, his rushing efficiency. So he averaged 6.2 yards per carry in college, which is a 78th percentile number. So pretty good. He was more efficient than the other guys on his team. Uh, his average yards per carry was 0.26 yards greater than other Baylor running backs. That's only a 39th percentile number. And his 10 yard run rate was actually 4.3% lower than theirs, which is really bad. It's a 10th percentile number. However, those guys were like a decent group of running backs. Uh, 3.29 stars as high school recruits, 51st percentile. So like a pretty average group of running back teams teammates that he had. All of that to say, he doesn't look great on the ground until you account for the box counts that he was seeing. The average box count that Abram Smith saw was 0.33 defenders heavier than the average box count seen by the collective running but like other dudes at Baylor, which it's tough to like, what does that even mean? But that's the highest relative box count that I have in my entire database. Guys like Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker in this class saw 0.22 higher than their teammates. Jonathan Taylor saw 0.06 higher than his teammates. AJ Dillon, like maybe the most like extreme example of like big time runner, like doesn't catch the ball. He saw 0.18 more defenders in the box on average than his teammates did. And Abram Smith was seeing 0.33. So he's just like smashing these dudes who are like classic two down backs. And if you account for those box counts, Counts. Like it's obviously harder to run against like a seven man box versus a five man box. And given that he was running against boxes that were heavier on average than those his teammates were, the average carry for Abram Smith was worth 136% the average carry for all the other Baylor running backs, which is second in this class, 
behind only Kenneth Walker, and it's in the 93rd percentile. He was also good in the open field, so uh, he turned 36% of his 10-yard runs into runs of 20 yards or more, 75th percentile. So, on the surface, smaller than we thought, not a pass catcher, took five years to break out. These are all the reasons why he's not being talked about in this class. Like, he's 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 not a guy that's, like, obviously, you know, the classic example, like, early breakout, pass catcher, big dude. Like, he's not those things that we're looking for. But given the flaws in his profile, digging deeper, like, okay, he had a lot tougher road to his efficiency than his teammates did. I don't really know why he took forever to break out, but when he did, he was really productive on a good team. He's good in the open field. Defenses were like absolutely stacking the box to stop him, and he was good anyway. So that's the case for Abram Smith. Uh, The second guy I want to talk about is Bryant Kobach from Toledo. He also stayed in college for five years. He actually spent his first year at Kentucky where he redshirted, didn't play at all. And then he transferred to Toledo where he was pretty solid early on. He had 900 yards as a freshman, uh, 1,100 yards as a sophomore. Those seasons, he caught only four and eight passes. So not involved really as a receiver at all. But uh, his sophomore year dominator rating, 28%, pretty solid. Year four was 2020. That was the COVID year. There were only six games that Toledo played, like, on their schedule, and Kobach had 500 yards, 24 receptions in those six games. So he, like, went from a guy who didn't catch the ball at all, 12 total receptions in two combined seasons, to then basically in a half of a season, he caught 24 passes. So he became, like, a legitimate part of the passing attack. And then this last year, his fifth year, he had 1,400 yards, 30 receptions, and a 33% dominator rating. So he was, like, legitimately active in the passing game, productive. He was listed at, like, 6'1", not 6'1", he was listed at, like, 6'2", 10, probably about 5'11", 210 at the combine. Just a quick Google, like, supposedly he ran, like, a 4'3", in high school. I don't know how legitimate that is, but, you know, we'll see at the combine. Actually, he didn't get invited to the combine. He's a, he's one of these combine snubs, so we'll have to see at his pro day. I don't know that he runs a 4-3 flat. Like, that would be ridiculous, but supposedly fast, and he's, like, a legitimately good pass catcher. His target share this last year was 13.7%, which is an 85th percentile number. His catch rate, 78%. That's above average, and he was catching passes, like, down the field. His average depth of target was 1.2 yards, which is 72nd percentile. His yards per target, just kind of, like, bird's-eye view receiving efficiency, 73rd percentile. All of that is really important for a small school player. If you're playing at like Alabama and you're not that involved in the passing game, okay, like there's dudes like Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy, like Jameson Williams. They got receivers they can throw the ball to. They have a bunch of other talented guys. If you're the running back at Toledo and you're not getting, you know, passing game involvement, kind of calls into question like how good are you? Even if you're not like a great receiver, your team should be trying to get you the ball on like dump off screens, like jet sweeps. Like if you're the best player on your team and you're going to be great in the NFL, your team better be trying to feed you like no matter matter how they can, including through the air. And Kobach, like, definitely checks that box. Small school guy, dominant in the passing game. His rushing efficiency is a little questionable. He played with, like, obviously at Toledo, like, really poor teammates um, in the backfield. Less than two stars uh, average, like, high school recruiting rating, which is the ninth percentile. Pretty, like, mediocre efficiency relative to them. His yards per carry was just 0.4 yards higher than theirs. His 10-yard run rate, less than a percent greater than theirs. Box-adjusted efficiency, just 120. 10% of theirs. Those are numbers in like the 44th, 49th, 30th percentiles. So relative to these teammates that like weren't very good, he was more efficient, but not more efficient relative to like what your typical NFL running back is compared to his teammates, which isn't a good look. However, a lot of that like negative efficiency comes from a terrible 2020 season. In that 2020 season, he averaged one and a half yards per carry less than his teammates. And his 10-yard run rate was 12% lower than theirs. He was just absolute trash in 2020. I don't know why. I don't know if COVID meant that he, like, didn't participate in an off-season program. I don't know if he personally had COVID. Like, I don't know why he was so bad in 2020. But he was really bad in 2020. And the case for Kobach kind of centers around him being the guy that we saw all the other seasons. And, like, 2020 being some sort of fluke. If you take out 2020 say that, like, something crazy happened that season. Typically, you don't want to, like, just pretend that that didn't happen. But for the sake of, you know, digging for gold in the trash here of kind of under-the-radar running backs, for that sake, let's say it 
it was an aberration. If you take away 2020, his yards per carry relative to his teammates jumps up to the 62nd percentile, and his 10-yard run rate relative to those guys jumps up to the 78th percentile. That's a little bit more palatable. Small school guy, 60th percentile, 80th percentile efficiency, much better than like 40th and 30th. So in the hypothetical world where something crazy happened in 2020 that probably won't happen again, Kobach looks pretty good. Basically, bad junior season, 23-year-old rookie, but efficient other than that one bad year, productive, and he's one of the few guys in this class who has like good size and receiving chops. The others are probably like Brees Hall, Isaiah Spiller, Keontae Ingram, Rashad White, and the next two guys I'm going to talk about. So that's Kobach. Let's go into Zaquandre White from South Carolina. This is actually one of my favorite guys. Um, he might be getting a little bit more buzz than some of these other guys, but definitely wanted to touch on Zaquandre White because I think he's really, really interesting. He's also a five-year guy. A lot of these guys are. That's a big reason why they're not getting buzz. But five-year guy, his first season at Florida State, which was back in 2017, he was a redshirt. His second season, he played linebacker. So like Abram Smith, I don't know why he's playing defense, but he, he was playing linebacker at Florida State. Then he wasn't getting playing time at running back. So he transferred to Iowa Western Community College where he dominated. His dominator rating was 38%, which is better than like Chase Edmonds, David Johnson, Austin Eckler, better than those guys were in their third seasons in college at like non-FBS programs. So kind of comparing like one-to-one, those guys weren't playing D1, Zaquandre wasn't playing D1, he was more productive than that than they were in year three. While he was there at Iowa Western, his yards per carry was 2.6 yards greater than the other dudes there, which is higher than both Austin Eckler and David Johnson did relative to their teammates in college. Completely dominant, like, non-FBS player. If that's all he did, he would look like a David Johnson-level prospect if he just stayed at community college. He didn't do that. He went to, uh, he transferred back to the FBS level, back to South Carolina, didn't play much that first year. 2021, he wasn't the starting running back. He was like a member of a committee. Um, some of the other guys there, Kevin Harris, he's also a running back in this class. Marshawn Lloyd, who is kind of a stud. Like he was a really highly touted prospect. who's like a young guy at South Carolina. So Zaquandre White was a member of that committee. And while he was there, he was a really good receiver. He had a 10.1% target share in the 62nd percentile, which given the size of his role in the offense is pretty incredible. Okay. This is like completely not the case, but let's say you're Derrick Henry at Alabama and you have a 40% dominator rating and a 10% target share. Relative to the size of your like entire role in the offense, you're not catching the ball that often. Like you're the best player, you're getting the ball a lot. Relative to a guy like Zaquandre White, whose dominator rating was like 19%, for him to have a 10% target share means even though he wasn't a huge part of the offense overall, they were making a concerted effort to like get him involved in the passing game. They want him out in space. Let's get this guy some targets. That's a good look. He was used pretty dynamically. He was lined up in the slot or out wide on almost 14% of his passing snaps, which is 77th percentile for a running back prospect. And he averaged seven yards per target, which is a 61st percentile number. So he was used dynamically, had a pretty sizable role, was efficient as a receiver. He's a little bit skinny. He's like 5'11", 212, actually 5'11 and a half, 212. So he's got that kind of like carry on Johnson body type, like tall, wiry frame. Supposedly he's like an athletic freak. Playerprofiler.com has his high school numbers up there, 451 in the 40, which would be faster than average for like guys testing at the combine. And he did that in high school. His shuttle time was 4.24 in the short shuttle. That's the same time that like Saquon, Le'Veon Bell, Jonathan Taylor, what they posted at the combine and his vert from high school was 43 and a half inches, which would be as far as I can tell the highest vert for a running back at the combine since 2007. And he did it at, a, at like the high school level. So this dude has like bunnies. He can absolutely get up. And then on the ground, I'm not like a film guy. I, I like to check out kind of generally how guys look, whether that's just like cutting on a highlight tape or, you know, looking at a little bit of film, not to, not to evaluate guys, but just to get kind of a sense of like stylistically how they are as a ball carrier. If you haven't seen Zaquandre White run, you have got to like cut on some highlight film because he is one of the most unique runners I've ever seen. He just moves in a way that that maybe I haven't seen anybody else do. He's like spinning and like ducking weirdly and like moving his legs in strange like angles. He's like drunk Alvin Kamara. It's like the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So check that out. But also 
He was efficient in college. Like I mentioned before, the guys he played with at South Carolina were pretty good. They averaged over three stars as high school recruits. They were in the 58th percentile. His yards per carry relative to those guys, 1.7 yards per carry higher than theirs. That's 90th percentile. Accounting for box counts, the average carry uh, for Zaquandre was worth 119% of the average carry for all the other Gamecock runners. 68th percentile, and he was like elite out in the open. His yak per reception, so not as a ball carrier, but like after he's caught the ball in a pass and he's now out in space, he averaged 11.6 yards after the catch per reception. That's in the 82nd percentile. And his breakaway conversion rate, so once he's already reached the second level, what is he doing once he gets there, is in the 97th percentile. He turned 47% of his 10-yard runs into runs of 20 yards or more. Like the dude is just amazing out in space. His 10-yard run rate was lower than his teammates, so I don't know that he has a lot of, like, nuance to his game. I don't know that he has, like, great vision, things like that. It's probably the reason why he wasn't, like, navigating the line of scrimmage, like, manipulating linebackers as well as the other guys on his team. But get him out in space, and he's efficient enough to, like, blow the overall efficiency out of the water for the other guys on his team. Um, He's also a tackle breaker. According to PFF, 4.34 yards after contact per attempt second in the class to Tyler Algier, uh, 0.3 missed tackles forced per attempt, fifth in the class. So like I said, the dude's like drunk Alvin Kamara. He's like falling all over himself, spinning around dudes, making things happen like out on the corner in the open field. The dude is, is like a weird runner, but it works. My like running back model, it's not really a running back model. It's just kind of like a collection of data points. But the way I, I evaluate guys, I, I'm able to generate comps, like using all these data points that I'm kind of touching on, um, including size, uh, efficiency numbers, all that stuff. Anyway, all those things go into a soup and like spits out comps and in like the pure runner category. So just looking at like ignoring production, ignoring receiving stats, like just looking at like size, athleticism, what these guys did as ball carriers. There's some really nice comps that pop up for Zaquandre White. Number one on his comps list is Melvin Gordon. Number three is Marlon Mack. Number seven is Ryan Matthews, which is pretty impressive for a guy that was like as low volume, as unproductive as he was for like some legitimate, like borderline Pro Bowl guys to pop up, like multiple of them to pop up in his top 10, you know, closest comps as a, as a pure runner. So basically the case for Zaquandre White as a non FBS player, he was like an Austin Eckler level dude. He's a good receiver. He's got size. He's a dynamic runner. He might be a freak athlete. I'm, he's probably the guy I'm most excited to see at the combine. I really hope that he kind of legitimizes what those high school numbers say. That'd be pretty exciting. Okay. The, what is this? The fourth guy I want to talk about is Jalen Warren from Oklahoma state. Another fifth year guy, his first two seasons in college, he actually spent them at snow college, which is like some little school in, in Utah. I found an interview online where Warren said that he wasn't able to go like the D1 level immediately because he had bad grades. So it wasn't necessarily because he was like a bad player, at least according to him. He just didn't have the grades to make it in school. So he went to Snow College. His first year there as a true freshman, he had a 20% dominator rating. Second year had a 31% dominator rating. That's right there with like David Johnson, Chris Carson, Antonio Gibson, you know, Ramondre Stevenson, what those guys were doing at similar points in their careers at non-FBS schools. So he's another one of these like small school producers. Then after that, uh, he transferred to Utah State. The first season there in 2019, he was a backup, like didn't play much at all. And then in 2020, he like blew up. He only played three games. That was the COVID year. Utah State only played six games, I think, total, and he missed three of them with an injury. But in the three that he did play, he had 250 yards and three touchdowns in those games for a 47% per game dominator rating, which for a fourth year guy would be in the 95th percentile. It's tough to look at a three game sample and say like, okay, he's a legit producer. He broke out that season, but we're mining for upside here, latching onto like positive things in the hypothetical world where like COVID doesn't happen or he doesn't get hurt. And he remains a large part of the offense at Utah state in 2020. Maybe NFL scouts are like able to pay a little bit more attention to him. Just like get more eyes on him. And who knows, maybe he declares last year. Maybe he's not a fifth-year guy. Maybe he has 1,500 rushing yards and 20 touchdowns. I don't know. It didn't happen because never got a chance to happen, but it's something to think about. After that, he transferred to Oklahoma State this season, and where he was the starter, and he had 1,400 yards, 11 touchdowns, and a 25% dominator rating. So basically the same as uh, what... Abram Smith did. That 25% dominator rating, though, in 2021 is higher than what Chuba Hubbard had at the same program 
the year before. So if we loved Chuba Hubbard and thought he was like the next coming, Jalen Warren comes in the season directly after that, same coaching staff, same team, and is more productive. So I don't know. Oklahoma State was also a good team. Like Baylor went 12-2, and Oklahoma State went 12-2. and These are like legitimate Big 12 programs. Abram Smith and Jalen Warren as fifth-year guys were productive starting running backs. Jalen Warren is a rocked-up dude. He's only 5'8", 215, so he's built like Mark Ingram, Javante Williams, Frank Gore, these like <laughs> rocked-up tank, short little dudes. He's a decent, like kind of mediocre receiver. Yards per target are pretty nice in the 69th percentile. He wasn't super involved as a receiver, just a 8% target share in like the 40th percentile. But over the course of his career, he caught 63 passes. So he like has demonstrated ability that he can catch the ball. And he was a pretty good runner. His yards per carry at Snow College, so you know, small school. He averaged 1.4 yards per carry more than his teammates. Overall, throughout his career, he averaged 0.72 yards per carry more than the other guys on his team. And that actually just looks at what he did at Utah State and Oklahoma State. So that ignores what he did at Snow. So against like D1 guys, he was averaging 0.7 yards per carry more than they were. His 10-yard run rate was 1% higher than guys at Utah State and Oklahoma State, 53rd percentile. And he was really nice in the open field. He converted 38% of his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs. That's in the 81st percentile. And he did that on a lot of volume. Like he was efficient while handling a large workload. He had 706 carries in college, which is in the 86th percentile. The case for Jalen Warren, he was a good player at every stop. He went to three different schools in college. He was good at every single one of them. He's densely built. 215 at 5'8 is like absolutely stout. And as a runner, he's explosive in the open field. He's efficient, and he did all that on high volume. So, who knows? The last guy I want to talk about is Letty Brown at West Virginia. And I'm actually shocked that Letty Brown is not getting more hype because he doesn't have the negatives in his profile that these other guys have, and I just, like, haven't seen buzz about Letty Brown. He was involved, but, like, not super productive his first two years at West Virginia, right around, like, 500 yards each year, um, right around a 10% dominator rating. In 2020, he took over as the starter. He had 1,200 yards, 11 touchdowns, 31 receptions, 32% dominator rating. This last year, almost 1,300 yards, 14 touchdowns, 36 receptions, 34% dominator rating. Both of those are in the 76th percentile for a third year player and a fourth year player. And given like the level of program he was playing at, like West Virginia is in a power five conference, but they're not like a powerhouse school. So relative to that, right around a 30, 35% dominator rating is what guys like David Montgomery, Deion Lewis, Duke Johnson, Maurice Jones-Drew, Marshawn Lynch, Ronald Jones, like all those solid NFL players were as productive as Letty Brown was at like similar tiered programs. So he's like legitimately productive. Um, his size is like pretty average, like right on the lines of average, like 5'11", 216. He was efficient as a runner, uh, 0.6 yards per carry higher than his teammates. That's uh, 55th percentile. He was really nice at uh, 10 yard run rate in the 78th percentile. And he wasn't good in the open field. Breakaway conversion rate was just in the 15th percentile, which kind of brings me to kind of an interesting quirk, I guess, in, in something I've noticed in these numbers. If you're going to have a, a high yards per carry relative to your teammates, and you're going to only have one of 10 yard run rate or breakaway conversion rate, like only one of those is going to be good. Like, obviously you'd rather have both. Obviously you'd rather have a guy who can do everything, but I would rather have a guy who's like bad in the open field but good navigating the line of scrimmage than the other way around. I want my efficiency to be fueled by like good vision, manipulating linebackers, like doing the little things right at the point of attack rather than just being good in the open field like when you eventually get there sometimes. So Letty Brown wasn't doing much when he got to the secondary, but he was making a lot of trips to the secondary. So pretty legit efficiency in my opinion and he did all of that like relative to teammates that were solid they averaged more than three stars as high school recruits he was seeing higher box counts than them um, his team relative box count was in the 71st percentile and the average carry for letty brown was worth 115 percent the per carry output of the other guys at west virginia which is a 45th percentile number some of that has to do with him not being very good in the open field but like pretty close to average. His three down ability is like pretty sneaky. He wasn't super efficient, but he was used a lot and he was used dynamically. He had 86 receptions in college. That's an 82nd percentile number. His target share, 78th percentile. And then he was split out wide over 12% of the time 
and his average depth of target was over a yard and a half down the field. That's a 72nd percentile number and a 62nd percentile number. So those are kind of the key indicators. Like, are you being moved out of the backfield and put elsewhere in the formation? And are you being targeted down the field and not just like behind the line of scrimmage on a screen? And he checks both of those boxes. And I know PFF likes him as a pass blocker. Um, His PFF pass blocking grade is the sixth highest among running backs in this class. So that is the Letty Brown profile. I guess the, the general case for him is he was upper percentile in breakout year not age, he was a he was a little bit older when he like even got to college, but he broke out year three. His dominator rating at a power five school is in like the 75th percentile. Uh, he's got like a 78th percentile target share. He's got good size. He's an efficient runner and he was prolific and like used dynamically as a receiver. I don't know what I'm missing here. He seems like a complete back to me. He's a lot better than these like sincere McCormick, Brian Robinson dudes that are getting hype. I am like a legitimate fan of Letty Brown. So I think it'll about wrap it up. Um, I don't know what exactly to do with these guys in like Dynasty or rookie drafts. Maybe one of them is the next James Robinson. Maybe one of them is the next Austin Eckler. Maybe one of them is just like the next Darwin Thompson. And it's like a dude who's good enough to, you know, make some buzz in training camp and in preseason. And you rostering them early enough and then are able to cash out when like the eventual hype happens. Maybe they're Patrick Laird. Maybe they just like latch on with the team and give you some usable weeks in best ball or whatever. But I think these are dudes who are not getting buzz, who I think are legitimately talented and legitimately more talented in this class than a lot of dudes who are getting buzz, but don't deserve it as much as these guys are. So hope you enjoyed the video. I think I'll be back uh, later this week with a Brees Hall versus Kenneth Walker video. I already talked about Isaiah Spiller, but Hall and Walker, kind of the guys getting hype as RB1. So I'm going to kind of compare their profiles, but yeah, thanks for checking it out. Deuces.